Good morning, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started here in a sec. Um, and as mentioned before, we're coming up on the end of the quarter. Uh, we have one more week of lecture after this. We're going to try and get through some aromatic reactions um, at um, in the next week's lectures, and then we'll have finals week. Um, then finals week, the the test is going to work a lot like the midterm did, where um, starting probably starting on Monday of finals week. Um, you will have to set aside two hours of time to take the test, but you can do it any time up to Thursday of finals week. And on Tuesday of finals week, um, we'll do a, a review session for anybody who wants to come, not mandatory. Um, and next, sometime next week, I will get you guys a practice test or at least a study guide um, so you know more or less what you're looking for what you should be focusing your, your energy on. The test is gonna look a lot like the midterm though. So um, should be thinking mostly in terms of, you know, what, what reactions did we add? Um, it's going to be a cumulative test, but it's gonna focus on the second half of the class on the stuff you haven't been tested on yet. So anything from the first half of class is fair game, you know, as far as, um, as far as addition reactions, especially as they apply to conjugated systems like we're talking about. But I'm gonna, we're gonna be spending most of our time talking about the stuff covered since the midterm. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, and again, so it's gonna be, <clears throat> Um, mostly reactions, most of the points are going to be in the reactions and mechanisms. Um, so you might want to start getting yourself a list of important mechanisms that we've covered. Um, start looking at review at the reaction review at the end of each chapter that we've covered, um, just to sort of start moving the right direction, start reviewing the material, make sure you haven't forgotten anything too much. <clears throat> Again, more details on that next week when we're a little bit closer. So today we're gonna try and finish out chapter 16. Um, we'll do some electrocyclic reaction practice for um, first, and then we're gonna talk about sigmatropic rearrangement, which is a class of these pericyclic reactions. Um, Remember, so the Diels-Alder reaction and the electrocy and the um, cyclo additions, we broke two pi bonds to make two new sigma bonds. In the electrocyclic reactions, we broke one pi bond to make one new sigma bond. In a sigmatropic rearrangement, we're gonna, it's gonna look very, very similar as far as the mechanism. It's gonna be three arrows, three pi bonds all moving at the same time. Um, except that we're not going to be making any new sigma, we're gonna be breaking one sigma bond and making a new sigma bond at the same time. So it's, it's harder to even to see how this is actually even a reaction because it looks, the product is gonna look very similar to what we started with, but it allows us to do things like make the more substituted product. Um, just by rearranging the electrons we already have in a way that looks like a resonance structure. Right, and then we're gonna talk about some of the criteria for what makes things aromatic in the, in the OCHEM sense. Um, and there's turns out there's a rule for that um, named after a guy named Huckel, who is no surprise, um, old white European dude. Um, like most of the rules that we hear about in OCHEM. Um, but you have to pronounce his name right because I had a, a, an instructor in grad school who, who told the entire grad level class that if we pronounced his name wrong, he would just straight up fail us. Um, I, I think he was joking, but he was an old Ukrainian dude who didn't joke very often. So I didn't want to test that. 
Um, so you also will have to pronounce his name correctly. It's Huckle, not Huckle. I'm assuming it's because Huckle was also Ukrainian or something like that, but I don't know that. All right, let's do some practice with the electrocyclic reactions. So remember, heat for HOMO, light for LUMO. HOMO is gonna have one fewer node than pi bonds. I'll give you guys a few seconds to try these out. And I realized I didn't put any in here for opening the rings. So let me, let me pull together a... Um, um, find a practice problem for that. And we'll, we'll do some ring opening reactions here in a second too. All right, well, our textbook doesn't have any more practice with ring opening reactions. So over the break, I'll check one of the other textbooks I have, um, see if I have some more good examples of ring opening reactions so we can practice that. Um, <clears throat> if not, that what we'll do is we'll go through the other ring opening reactions we've talked about and uh, just flip whether we're dealing with, high, with heat or light. Um, for the purposes of, of practicing, even if it's the same molecule, we can still go through the process. All right, so if we are looking at A, so a cyclohexene with, with the attached groups here, Is that right? Did I get this? The, um, are the methyls pointed the right direction? Okay. 
and said heat, correct? Okay. So if we're looking at heat, heat means homo. So we can start by drawing the homo. So three pi bonds, so draw six p orbitals. And if it's the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital, it has one fewer node than pi bonds. So our nodes are going to go here and here. So now if we're trying to, if we're going to fill in the shading, it doesn't matter where you start shading. But if you're going from left to right, Every time you get to a node, switch whether you're shading the top or bottom. And then I hit another node, so I'm back to shading the bottom. So regardless of what else is going on, we've got our ring structure and the two pi bonds, or the two p orbitals at the end of our ring structure have the shading pointed the same direction. And again, it doesn't matter whether that's top or bottom, they just both have to be shaded the same direction. And then they both have their methyl group pointed outward because we're looking at the molecule from over here. Right, so if we're looking for the molecule from over here, the ring is behind that pi p orbitals at the end. The methyls are sticking sort of out and towards us. And so that means if we're trying to make the shaded section overlap or the unshaded section overlap, doesn't really matter. If we're trying to make the shaded section overlap. We have to rotate these opposite directions, which makes this disrotatory. So One's going clockwise, one's going counterclockwise, which means both of the methyl groups, they were both pointed outward. Now they're gonna be both pointed in the same direction, either up or down. It's hard to make my hands rotate down. The way I have it drawn here, they're going to go down, they would both rotate downward. So our product would look like the cyclohexane group does, didn't change. Our mechanism would look like this. So we move those pi bonds. So we wind up with this as our product. And again, you could have drawn them both upward as well because it's a symmetrical compound. And what's important is that you drew them as being cis. All right, so once you start getting comfortable drawing the homo and the lumo with the number of nodes, you, you don't have to draw this section in the bottom left. It can be helpful to see what's actually happening, what it actually looks like, and make sure that you get it right. But if it, once you're comfortable drawing and, and picturing what this is going to look like based on the number of nodes, you can jump straight to this.
right? I wouldn't, at this point, I wouldn't advise skipping that step completely and jumping straight to the product because it takes a lot of practice to be able to see, um, okay, con rotatory means that my methyls are going to be pointed this way. Is It's tricky to be able to visualize all of these steps at the same time. So I would advise drawing at least one of these steps, um, but it's not some, you don't need to, do this if I just ask for what's the product. If I ask for the mechanism that I, or some explanation as to why a specific isomer is being formed, then you probably want to draw most of this. And since we're spending a lot of time on these mechanisms, and you guys know that I like molecular orbitals, um, you can be pretty sure that there will be a question that that asks you to explain things in terms of these orbitals and homo and lumo um, on the test. So it'd be a good idea to be fairly comfortable with this. If we start with the exact same molecule, but with light instead, now we're dealing with the LUMO and remember the LUMO is going to have the same number of nodes as pi bonds. So three pi bonds, three nodes. In other words, it's going to switch up and down three times. Oops, got ahead of myself trying to trying to avoid letting Excel think out or a PowerPoint think I was right clicking. So the two orbitals at the end have their phases pointed in opposite directions. So if we're going to have these rotating so that the phases overlap, it's gonna be con-rotatory. which means we're going to get the trans product, rather both of the trans products. It's a little cramped over there on the end. Again, it's I, based on the substitution, there are only two stereo centers here. For, so for this one, you could have just put plus EN because all of the stereo centers are being flipped. But if there was anything attached to the uh, ring structure that you started with, you can't just put plus EN because 
if we had a methyl that was sticking out over here, we didn't flip every stereo center because we left that one alone, right? So if there's more than the, just the two stereo centers that we added, we need to be careful saying plus EN. So again, it's not a bad idea to be in the habit of just drawing both of the enantiomers. So let's do one that is not three pi bonds. Let's look at C, where we have eight pi electrons, eight p orbitals for four pi bonds. It's a, still a conjugated pi system. So we're still going to be looking at, at electrocyclization. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If we're dealing with heat, it's the HOMO, which means one fewer node than pi bond. So we have three nodes. And it doesn't really matter exactly where they go. If it's an even, um, if it's an odd number of nodes, then you always have to have one node that goes right through the middle based on the, the rules of symmetry. And you try to keep them equally spaced as much as you can. But again, it doesn't really make a difference for the for this reaction, because what we really care about is what the two p orbitals at the end look like. So start your shading. Every time you hit a node, switch. So that means that our orbitals at the end are going to be pointed in opposite directions. Well, their phases are. And again, the this is another example with the This is another example where the two methyls that are attached at the end of your pi system are both pointed outward to start. All right, so we start with something that looks like this. We want the two shaded sections to overlap with each other or the two unshaded sections. Again, it doesn't matter. So, because we had three nodes, we wind up with this being con-rotatory, which means we're gonna get the product that looks like this. Right, so the net result of the electrocyclizations is always you've lost a pi bond and you're gonna gain a sigma bond. And for the last one, we need to, we're just switching whether we're using heat or light. Any questions so far? How are we doing? Yeah, I put one in the chat. Um, oh, thank you. I'm sorry. Versus disrotary has to do with even or odd number of nodes. 
Yes. Because if we're if we have an even number of nodes, then we're going to wind up with the phases pointed in the same direction. And that means that in order to get them to overlap properly, it has to be disrotatory. So an even number of nodes will always give you disrotatory. An odd number of nodes gives you conrotatory. Um, if I can add on to that question, you said something that there's always one less node than there are pi bonds. For the homo. For the homo. Um, I'm <laughs> so then what I, I don't see, is that like our ending molecule then has one less or I'm just confused. What do you mean? Cause I'm not seeing the one less node. Okay. If we, um, if we take it back to looking at what the possibilities are mm -hmm. as far as just drawing a molecular orbital energy diagram, the lowest energy possibility um, is going to be all of your nodes. So I'm going to do it with just the simple system with just um, two pi bonds in a row. Mm -hmm. So if we have two pi bonds in a row, we could have no nodes and everything would be shaded the same way. That's going to be our lowest energy because everything's going to have the best possible overlap. <clears throat> okay. Well, and the, the next lowest hang, hang in with me and see if I answer your question. The next lowest energy state would be if we added one node. So we went from zero nodes before. So now we have one node. That's not quite as good as no nodes because no nodes is lowest energy because everything it can overlap and is everything's pointed the same way. And we can keep going with this. The next, next possibility would be two nodes. And if we want to know what the homo is versus the lumo, we look at these possibilities and we start adding in a pi electrons until we run out of pi electrons. So if we only had two pi bonds to start with, we only have two pairs of pi electrons, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're putting electrons into our orbital, once we fill up that second energy level, that's all of the electrons that we have. That's what makes this the homo because it's the highest energy um, orbital that has electrons in it. And it's always going to wind up that based on how we fill these up from bottom, bottom up, from lowest energy up, your homo will always have one node less than the number of pi bonds you started with. Okay, yeah, I think I, I think through you talking, I answered my own question. I was just looking at it wrong. I was looking at it as like the groups of the orbitals instead of just the dashed line. So yes. that makes more sense. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so let's go back to our four pi orbital or four pi bond system. If we're looking at it with light, light tells us that we're using the LUMO and the LUMO is always going to have the same number of nodes as pi bonds. So we have four pi bonds, the LUMO means we have we have four nodes in there. So our P orbitals, four, five, six, seven, eight. If we're gonna have four um, nodes in there, gonna go, this should be symmetrical. So one, two, 
again, doesn't exactly matter where you draw the dotted lines. What matters is that if there's four nodes, there's four places where it switches top to bottom. Which if we have it switching back and forth between top and bottom four times, that's, a, that's like multiplying something by negative one four times in a row. You're gonna wind up with it being the same as where it started. Um, and Sean, mm -hmm. so if we have, um, when we draw the lines, I've noticed that you always do the pairs and there's a single one on the outside of the pairs. Is that gonna be every single time? If we have an even number, yes. We have an odd number, what would that look like? So if we have an odd number of nodes, you're always gonna have one go right through the middle. And then you try to keep them in pairs as much as you can. Mm -hmm. So it, again, for, this, for the purposes of, of drawing the product, it's not gonna make a difference because what matters is that you have a node period. You could put them all right next to each other if you wanted to. Well, like let's, um... If there's like, well, I guess I'm going to answer my own questions, but like, let's say there's seven, would you put one in the middle and then go from that way? Like there's like seven um, phase changes. I don't know. I'm like, I'm not yeah, sure. no. So that, that would be a super high energy orbital, right? But we could, we no, could draw there's that. Seven, there's seven of the little like infinity signs. Oh, so I'm you're always going to have an even number of those. Always. Because otherwise it's not, you can't have a pi bond without, um, without two p orbitals, right? A pi bond has to have two atoms involved. Yeah. Because it's, it's a bond. So by definition, it has to have something at each end of the bond. Um, okay. That would be a really weird system. And you could, you could theoretically have something, if you had something like, like a, a carbocation in the middle of two pi bonds. You could conceivably have five p orbitals. And then in that case, a node would go right through the middle of one of them, um, which would not be very, would not be very stable. Um, and it would basically look like a pi bond, an empty spot and another pi bond. So it's definitely Definitely possible, but just not for these conjugated dienes like this. Right. Let me go back to answering this one. Oh no, that's not where it was at all. Dealing with a LUMO. All right, and again, what, what really matters for this one is what the end looks like. And so where you put the nodes doesn't matter as much as if you have the right number of nodes. So if you think of, of the right of the num a node as switching it from being positive to negative, if you switch back and forth from positive to negative an even number of times, you're going to get the same thing out that you started with. If you switch back and forth an odd number of times, you're going to get the negative. Uh, on the energy diagram I had on previous with the LUMO B, the zero nodes, or two nodes. If we so if we had if we had just two pi bonds, so four p orbitals, the LUMO would be two nodes. The lowest energy that has is pretty much always going to have electrons in it. So we draw it for the because that's how we can we can justify. Okay, this is our homo. This is our LUMO. But you don't. But it's never going to be reactive in these reactions. It's always so stable; it's going to stay the way it is.
Um, and the, because the other key is LUMO, the U stands for unoccupied, meaning no electrons are in it. I keep doing that out of habit, but it just confuses things with the shading when I shade the wedges. All right, so if we're looking at the LUMO for four pi bonds, we wind up with the shaded sections pointing the same direction. Which means we're going to wind up with it being disrotatory. And we're going to get the product that looks like that looks like this, it's the cis product. All right, so what we're mainly looking for is we look at how many pi bonds do I have? Am I dealing with the homo or the lumo because the if you're using heat, you're dealing with the HOMO and the HOMO has one fewer node than the number of pi bonds. If we're using light, we're dealing with the LUMO. And the LUMO is always going to have the same number of nodes as pi bonds. Hey, Sean, I got a question. Yeah. Because of the shape and the alkene being at the opening of the mouth, it's it's um, it's always going to have that shape where you have like kind of like that figure eight orbital if you picture on the right, and whatever is attached to it's always going to be on the left or right, correct? Or or are they going to be in different areas? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you can have them. We only care about the rotations for what's attached at the very, at the very, at the mouth of the ring structure, as you put it, which I think is a good way of thinking about it. Um, because whatever else, if we, if say we had a methyl group attached somewhere else, that carbon stays as sp2 throughout the reaction, right? The only carbons that are really rotating are the ones that are going from sp2 to sp3. And those are the ones where you're making the sigma bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you went two carbons to the right of that line that you just made, mm -hmm. left picture, I, I was talking like right there. So because whatever's attached at that carbon and because of the alkene, it'll always be drawn laterally, like outside on that first picture or no? Not necessarily. You could have one that looked like that. You just have to be careful drawing it so that you don't wind up with things overlapping with each other. But you could start with them being sort of pointed in the same direction as opposed to both pointed outward. Got you. Okay. Thank you. Due to sterics, it's usually going to be most stable when they're both pointed outward. Um, so we see that the most. And a good, a good um, rule of thumb is if it's hard to draw without things running into each other, then there's probably a lot of sterics there too. Because if it's hard to draw without these things running into each other, the physical objects are probably running into each other as well. Um, so these tend to be more stable when you can have those R groups pointed away from each other. Um, but it's not, it's not a super hard rule. Um, and we do see there were a few um, practice problems we started with them facing inward or one of them facing inward anyway. All right. Rather than jump into a new topic, let's take our break a few minutes early. Um, and when we come back, I'll try to have some more practice problems for the electrocyclic reactions. So we can try and get feeling these ones, these ones should feel good 
by the time we're we're done here because they're very predictable if we can think about them the right way. So we need to just practice thinking about them. So um, let's, we'll do a few more. We'll do some ring opening and a couple more ring closing reactions. I just have to find the problems that we'll, that we'll do. All right, so let's come back in 10 minutes, 10 till, and we'll go from there.
Hey, Sean, sorry about that. I got a question whenever you get a chance. Yeah, what can I do for you, RJ? What's up, RJ? Oh, sorry. Uh, letter C, was that con -reditory or dis -reditory? So even number of pi bonds and it was heat. So that's going to be con -reditory, I believe. Does that match everybody's notes? I'm just doing that from memory. Okay. Yeah, because you're going to wind up, if you have an odd number of nodes, you're going to wind up with your two shaded sections pointed in opposite directions, so up and down. So to get them to overlap, you would need to rotate one inward and one outward, which means they're both going to be going clockwise or both counterclockwise, so con rotatory. Gotcha. It was the counterclockwise that was throwing me off. Okay, cool. All right. Um, it's surprisingly difficult to find these practice problems. I've tried three different textbooks and a bunch of different online resources, um, and they all present things at slightly different levels than what we're going over them. Um, so we're just going to go with the um, we'll do the practice problems from yesterday. We're just going to switch all of the heat versus light. So some of this might be, I think we've done that once or twice already. So hang on one second. All right, so we'll do, do a few of these. Um, there are some examples in here of ring opening reactions as well. So if we start, um, A is very similar to what we just did, except it's dealing with ethyls instead of methyls. So we'll skip A. And so for B, it's a ring opening reaction. So we have to, we're trying to turn it into the proper orbital, as opposed to starting from the, the homo or the lumo, we're trying to turn it into the correct homo or lumo. So let me get a whiteboard here. We have ethyls pointing upward from both of the active carbons. And yesterday we did it with heat. So today let's do it with light. Um, so if we're trying to, it only has one p orbital here, but it's already formed the ring. So when we opened it, it's going to have two p orbitals. So all of our rules and all the practice we've been doing applies to the, the larger pi system, the conjugated pi system. So we want to draw if we start with the ring instead of the larger pi system, we still want to draw the larger pi bond system, which would be two pi bonds in this case. And we're dealing with light. So that tells us that we're dealing with the LUMO. So we need the same number of nodes as pi bonds. So two nodes. And that's going to, that means we're going to, we're trying to turn it into this orbital shape. So we're starting with our orbitals.
we're starting with our orbitals overlapped. And this is the, the sigma bond in between the two carbons. That we're trying to turn those two carbons back into being a conjugated pi system. So right now, if we draw them as, let's say that's the unshaded section. So our shaded sections are gonna be the outer sections. And both of these have the ethyl pointed upward. So if we're trying to turn it into the LUMO, We need both of our shaded or unshaded sections pointed in the same direction. So if they're already overlapping, we're gonna need the shaded part that's not overlapping to rotate downward, say. We're gonna wind up with it being disrotatory so that both of the sh shaded sections point the same direction and the unshaded section point the same direction. Hang on one second. My kids found, found the old walkie talkies at my, my parents' house that have um, that we used to use when I was skiing when I was in middle school. And let me tell you that walkie talkies and cell phones have come a long time. And so right now the house is just filled with yelling and what, what did you say? Cause they're talking with it right here in front of their mouth and they're having lots of fun with it though. And that's what matters. All right. So if we are trying to open this the rest of the way, what that's gonna look like after it opens is, actually I can stick with my color coding here. We're gonna wind up with the, the one that I drew the orbital in black rotating. So the ethyl points outward. So we're gonna wind up with both of the ethyls pointed outward or both of the ethyls pointed inward. If we rotate it the other direction, both of the ethyls would be pointed inward towards each other. And then the rest of the molecule is still there. It's just not really changing as much. So I have not been focused on drawing it. The rest of that ring structure is still there. And so when we draw this whole molecule, we'll wind up with our what was our ring is now opened. And Emily, I also wanted to bring up that the, um, the odd number of p orbitals um, was something that showed up in, in a lot of the other, in the more advanced problems that I kept finding when I was trying to find pra more practice problems for you guys. Um, so you are absolutely asking the right questions. It's just at a, at a upper division OCHEM level, as opposed to where, we're, where we are right now. So you're just thinking ahead with that one. Um, and I'm going to tell you to 
not not do that for right now. <laughs> All right, let me clear this and go back to the other practice problems. How are we feeling? Do we want to do just one more ring opening one? Do you guys want to keep practicing on this? We're we're close to a good stopping point for the quarter as it is anyway. So I'm fine doing more practice and going slow with this. Okay. Then let's do let's do these. Let's do the rest. I think the um let's do C and we'll switch heat for light. This is one of the ones that RJ was asking about too, where they're both pointed in the, where they're not both pointed outward. So it's a little bit different that way. And then when was there, were there um, two more methyls on here somewhere maybe like that? Okay. And it was heat before, so let's do it with light. So we've got three pi bonds and is drawn sort of in an octagonal shape, mostly to allow space for these ethyl groups, since they're not both pointed outward. Um, it's going to still be the two carbons at the end of each pi system that are gonna be doing the reacting. So if we're starting with, um, light, we're dealing with the LUMO, which means we have three nodes. And um, if we want to draw these out, draw your six P orbitals, three nodes, means one of the nodes goes right down the middle. Every time you hit a node switch. And again, if you wanna practice if you hold your thumb up, if you wanna do this without drawing all of them, think of your thumb as being the shaded section. So if you started on the left with it, with the shaded section being down, and then you have three nodes, you have to switch your thumb three times. So it started here, you go one, two, three. And that means your shaded section is on the opposite side. Excellent work, Elke. All right, so that's the way to get around having to draw the actual orbitals and put in the nodes yourself, because that allows you to draw our final figure just by going by counting how many nodes there are and using your thumb, switch it back and forth, right? If you have an even number of nodes, you're gonna wind up with it with your thumb pointing the same direction at the end as it started. And then now, now however, we don't have them both pointed outward. And so now we have to be careful how we're drawing this.
We have one of our ethyls pointed outward and the other one is pointed inward. So it doesn't have to be drawn to scale, just that they have to be pointed the right direction. And so now we have something that is dis, or sorry, that is con rotatory, because we need to rotate both of them clockwise or both of them counterclockwise. And so the ethyls are both rotating the same way. So our product All right, so the ring closing reactions, hopefully we're feeling, starting to feel a little more confident, even if you'd be hard pressed to, to do it on your own, should be getting better and better. Let's do, let's do one more. All right, let's do A on 21. So we're, again, we're gonna switch to heat. All right, so three pi bonds, six p orbitals using heat. So are you dealing with the homo, which means two nodes? If you're using our thumbs up method, you start with thumbs down and there's two nodes. First node, thumbs up, second node, thumbs down again. So the orbitals at the end look like this. The rest of that ring structure is just there. We're gonna worry about filling it in later. We get disrotatory, because we get one clockwise, one counterclockwise, which means our product And again, it could be drawn upward just as easily, It'd be the same product. There's it's cis though. What are you working on up there? Nice. That's pretty nifty, isn't it? All right, let's do one more ring opening since those are the tricky ones and we'll reassess. Yeah. 
Can I have one dinosaur Not right now. Okay. All right, so cyclohexene group with a cyclobutyl attached. And it was light before, so let's do heat. Is that right? So we're trying to make it look like. I love you too. We're trying to make it look like it has one node. Right now, it doesn't have any nodes really because it's not a conjugated pi system we're trying to make it look like a conjugated pi system and it's heat so we're dealing with the homo which means one node so right now it looks like I love you too, Pixie. All right, so right now it looks like this and both of our methyl groups are sticking straight up. So if we want it to rotate so that the two phases are pointed in opposite directions, we need the, the shaded section to be up on one of them and down on the other. So if we put the shaded section down on the left, we need the shaded section to be up on the right. So we'll wind up with it being con-rotatory. And we'll wind up with both of the methyls. After we do the rotation, we're gonna wind up with One of our methyls pointed to the left. And the other methyl also pointed to the left. And then the rest of the rings, what was the ring structure is still there. So our final product There's, we opened the ring, there's one methyl, there's the other methyl. And then we could have rotated it the other way. So we could also have which is the same molecule, right? We took the first molecule and flipped it, flipped it vertically like a pancake. We'll wind up with the second molecule. There are no carbons with more than, with four unique things attached to it. So no R versus S. Right, and notice that this is one of the things I kind of like about using the my tablet rather than a giant whiteboard is that it's kind of allows me to organize it the same way for all of these, right? For each of these, draw I've drawn my starting molecule at the top and the conditions, then I bottom left, I draw the orbital shape, then I draw what the 
what everything is in terms of what's substituted and where everything's pointed to start with. So I can show my rotation, right? You can go through the same process every time. Starting molecule and conditions, draw all the orbitals, draw the orbitals with things filled in, show your rotation, then draw your final product. All right, and C is very similar to C on 1620. So I think we can leave that one for now and we'll spend the last, last bit of class today talking about sigma tropic rearrangements, but I gotta switch to my other slides. All right, so I mentioned earlier, sigma tropic rearrangements are gonna look very similar to both the Diels-Alder reaction and the electrocyclic reactions um, in that there's not gonna be any charged intermediates. Everything's gonna happen at once and it's gonna be usually three arrows all happening at the same time, sort of moving in a circular pattern. Right, and so that's what we see Right here, this is this is a classic example of a sigma tropic rearrangement. Um, and it just happens when you have, if you have pi bonds that can move around uh, and they don't even need to be conjugated in this case. In this case, they're not conjugated. But if you have two pi bonds that can, that can go through a similar process to the electrocyclic reaction, we're just not gaining any net gain of sigma bonds. We wind up with the same number of sigma bonds on both sides and the same number of pi bonds on both sides. Um, so essentially what this allows us to do or allows the molecules to do I broke PowerPoint, hang on. All right, hopefully that'll work better. Um, we, this is not gonna necessarily have any obvious benefits right off the bat, but it can allow us to switch from a, a diene, um, from one diene to a more substituted diene. So remember Zaitsev's rule is when we do um, elimination reactions, we try to make the most substituted alkene because that's the most stable. Sometimes if we start with, with a diene um, that's not very substituted, we can rearrange things so that it's more substituted. That's not the case here. In this first one, um, we wind up making something that's just as stable as where we started. So this was this one, we wouldn't even be able to tell the difference because we wind up making the same molecule we started with. But there are a couple of cases where we do wind up with things rearranging. If we have something that's substituted, if you look at the example of the molecule on the left, um, you have two primary alkenes 
versus a primary alkene and a secondary alkene. The more substituted alkene is more favorable. And so if you, if you apply heat, we wind up with the, um, we wind up with the entire thing rearranging to put the pi bonds on the inside of the molecule. Okay, Vail, let's go outside and call Thomas. See if you can go find the kitty. She's she just went into the neighbor's yard. So why don't you go call her and see if she'll come to you? <laughs> All right, so that's what's known as the cope rearrangement. Um, and the, so the cope rearrangement is dealing purely with alkenes. And it's just trying to rearrange things to make the more stable alkene. And you, you in general, you're gonna have to be able to arrange these in sort of a, um, a cyclohexyl shape. Even if we're not making a full cyclohexene group, they have to have that overall shape in order for them to move the right way. She's coming, good job, Valence. All right, and the, the Claisen rearrangement um, is very similar. We still wind up with the same number of pi bonds before and after. The only difference is um, that we make a carbonyl instead of an alkene. Carbonyls are more stable than alkenes are. So if you have a choice if to rearrange some pi electrons in a way that gives you a carbonyl, that's gonna be favorable. All right, and so these are kind of difficult to see exactly or to predict off the top of your head what's happening or going to happen because there's a lot of molecules that can go through similar rearrangements like this. Um, so for the sigmatropic rearrangements, for the most part, I want you to be aware that they exist. Um, and if I showed you two possibilities that you could predict which one was gonna be more stable and more favored at equilibrium, um, is that's, that's really the level that we're looking for it at this point, is just which of these possibilities is going to be favored at equilibrium. Right, and with that, we're done with chapter 16. Um, so reminder, the three reactions we really covered in chapter 16, right? So there were four reactions. There were, there were three pericyclic reactions. There was the Diels-Alder cycloaddition. There was the electro, electrocyclic reactions that we spent a lot of time on where we dealt with homos and lumos. And then there's these sigmatropic ones that are really kind of difficult to predict. Um, but we, we're not gonna focus on them very much. They're not as interesting chemically. We need to know that they happen because that's one of the reasons that things can um, have a shelf life is because over time, something that starts as one molecule will gradually turn into another. Um, but we're not going to spend too much time and effort on the sigmatropic rearrangements. Aromatic compounds, on the other hand, are something that matter a lot in organic chemistry. So we're going to end this quarter talking about aromatic compounds. And we're going to talk more about the reactions of aromatic compounds next quarter, along with um, a lot of carbonyls. Um, and so let's let's go ahead and define aromatic compounds. Now, aromatic compounds in general are going to have a couple key characteristics. It's going to be a bunch of conjugated pi bonds, um, and they also have to have a ring structure. So you need both of those for it to be aromatic. So this is not aromatic in the the, the culinary or the English language sense of the word aromatic that just means fragrant or that it has a strong smell to it. A lot of aromatic compounds do have a strong smell, um, but that is not what makes them aromatic in chemistry. 
Um, so here's some, some common aromatic compounds that are found in uh, a lot of, of herbs. A lot of the reasons that herbs and spices smells as strongly as they do is because they have a lot of aromatic compounds. Um, Transanethal and estragol are isomers of each other and they're both found in anise. Transanethal is what gives anise and, and black licorice its really characteristic flavor. And estragol is present in a lot of the same compounds. It's estragol is why fennel has sort of an anise-y, licorice-y smell to it sometimes um, because estragol will trigger a lot of the same taste receptors as transanethal. Um, mysterisin is found in nutmeg or cumin? One of the two, I think nutmeg has mysterisin in it. <clears throat> um, and eugenol is clove oil. And iso eugenol is also found in smaller amounts in, in um, cloves, but it's more, it's found in cumin and in nutmeg actually, I believe. <clears throat> um, so we do see a lot of these similarities and the common structure for all of these is that benzene ring. So benzenes are the most common aromatic feature. Um, turns out there are other compounds that can be aromatic. Oh, just more, more um, examples of pharmaceuticals that have aromatic compounds. Um, everything from, and we'll see this a lot um, because the most common, the most common neurotransmitters that our body uses are based around phenylalanine, which has a benzene ring in it. And so a lot of pharmaceuticals also have benzene rings. Um, so Prilosec, Prevacid. Yeah, so both of these inhibit proton pumps, meaning that they're going to slow down the production of acid as well as mess with your, um, your metabolism because proton pumps are wind up being really important in your uh, electron transport chain as well. So they, they can have lots of weird side effects that you wouldn't expect from an antacid per se. Um, there's, you know, there's Zoloft is down here. There's a super wide range of molecules. So aromatic compounds don't have sort of one distinct effect on the body, just like they don't have one distinct smell. Um, they're going to react in a variety of different ways. Um, it's usually going to be dependent on what else is attached to it and what's the overall shape. If we're trying to name these, we, for the most part, we name, name them based on um, around a benzene as the parent molecule. We just use prefixes in many, most cases. <clears throat> Um, to name these. So chlorobenzene, ethylbenzene, nitrobenzene. However, a lot of these molecules were discovered before, um, before the IUPAC naming system was common. And a lot of times before we actually knew what the molecular structure was for these. So aromatic compounds have a lot of common names. And we I am going to require you to know some of these common names and use these common names. Um, specifically, these first, these first four are the ones that show up the most. Um, benzoic acid and benzaldehyde are technically common names, but they also make a lot of sense based on what the functional groups are, right? They're technically irregulars, but not really. It, benzoic acid is benzene with, a, with an acid group attached. Benzaldehyde is benzene with an aldehyde attached. <clears throat> um, these other ones though show up all over the place. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so toluene, gets used as a paint thinner a lot. Toluene is a very common solvent. 
that you can actually buy as toluene in a hardware store um, if you're on the Nevada side of the border. Um, California has regulations against using toluene because it's bad for the environment. Um, so it, it is also a really good paint thinner though. So while I don't recommend breaking the law and I do say that you need to dispose of it properly, um, yeah, if you're working on doing a, a paint, painting project, um, buy your solvents in, in Nevada. Um, and then just make sure that you dispose of them properly. Um, phenol, we've discussed before a little bit, OL means alcohol. P-H-E-N means benzene ring, a phenol ring. So phenol is a benzene ring with an OH on it. Um, aniline is really pretty nasty stuff. You don't see it, you, get, you wouldn't be able to buy it necessarily any place. Um, I believe it's a teratogen, which means it causes mutations in your, it kind of gets in the way of um, cellular division and mitosis. And so it can cause mutations in your cells. So that's a step beyond just being a carcinogen. Um, and anisole is not as nasty. It shows up in a lot of places. It's really common base molecule and a lot of those aromatic um, spices have that methoxy group attached to a benzene ring. Um, that one's not as commonly used in, in papers or in textbooks as well. If you said methoxy benzene, nobody would look at you sideways um, and everybody would know exactly what you were describing. But for these other ones, nobody says methyl benzene. Nobody says amino benzene. You say toluene and aniline. And then for these other win ones, styrene, that's what styrofoam is made out of. That's why it's named styrofoam, because it's puffed up polystyrene. And acetophenone is not as critical to know that one either. The main one, the main ones that, that I want you to really know the names for are these first four. And then benzoic acid and benzaldehyde. But I think you guys can handle those ones without too much trouble. Um, and then if we have anything else attached, there are other, there are lots of other um, common names for benzene derivatives, for instance. If you had two methyl groups attached to a benzene, actually, let's see, is that on the next one? Um, if you have two benzene rings or two methyls attached to a benzene ring, um, that's not called methyl toluene. That has its own common name as well called xylene. Um, sometimes called xylol. That one's really confusing to me because there's no alcohol involved. So I don't know why they call it that, but you see it labeled that way in hardware stores. It's another common paint thinner. Um, and so there's a lot of them. If you have a methyl phenol, it's not called methyl phenol, it's called something else. Um, but the single substituted ones, the first four here, are the ones that are most commonly used that I want you to be paying attention to. If we do have two substitutions on a benzene ring, um, the, the IUPAC numbering system works well. Count it one, two, three, four. Um, so for instance, if you had bromotoluene, you could name it as three bromotoluene. The, the carbon on the benzene ring that has the methyl is gonna be carbon one. And then you just say one, two, three, just like we've done before. However, there's another way of naming these things that's, rel that's describing how close they are relative to each other that does still show up. And that's named with ortho, meta, or para. If you have something where your substitutions are directly next to each other, so they're attached on adjacent carbons, 
Um, instead of you putting a number to that, sometimes you will see night ortho being used. Ortho means adjacent. Meta means once removed. And para means opposite. Um, and the, we still use that, that description, even though we have these better way of doing it with, with the numbers, um, because when we're describing some of these reactions, we're going to see, we'll describe something as being an ortho director, meaning that it, it, it causes an addition reaction to happen at the adjacent carbons. Or, um, and there are two ortho, if we look at the, at toluene, for instance, so if there's our toluene, there are two ortho positions that are equivalent to each other chemically. There are two meta positions that are equivalent to each other chemically. And there's one para position, right? So we still use ortho, meta, and para when we're talking about reactions of benzenes because we'll talk about, okay, it's going to be added in the ortho position or the meta position. And that could mean either of those two ortho carbons because they're chemically identical. Yes, this is chapter 17 now. Um, so I want you to be aware of those terms and we will continue to use them. But as far as you guys naming, naming compounds, I'm totally fine with you just using the numbering system because that's a better system, frankly. Um, it just doesn't, the problem with the numbering system when we're talking about, um, the adjacent positions is that if, if the methyl is attached to carbon one, that means that carbons two and, and six are identical to each other chemically. And that's harder to visualize than to just say it's the ortho position, right? The same, so it's, it's similar to saying the benzylic position or the allylic position was a way of describing things that were once removed from a pi bond or once removed from a benzene ring um, rather than using the numbers. That's why we also use ortho, meta, and para when we're talking about things that are attached on a benzene ring. And let's see. We're gonna go through this kind of quickly once now, and then we'll, we'll cover it again. So you've heard it, um, heard it twice. Um, and yes, to answer your question, we can only use ortho, meta, and para if there's already something present. If there's, if there's nothing, if there's no substitution on there, then all of those carbons are identical to each other, right? And if all of the carbons are identical to each other, you can't have ortho, meta, and para. Um, if, you have, if you have one substitution, then we, talk, we can talk about the carbons on the benzene ring relative to that substitution. And that's when we'd use ortho, meta, and para. We could also use it if we have something that's disubstituted. So if we had a, a methyl here and let's see, say a, um, a chlorine here. We could describe it as saying the chlorine is meta relative to the or to the methyl group, or the chlorine is on the meta carbon relative to the methyl group. So we still use use those terms to describe the molecule with two um, two substituents, but just as it'd be just as easy to say it's on you know, it's uh, 
and it's going to be three chloro, three chloro toluene, as opposed to saying meta chloro toluene. The three chloro toluene is just is probably more descriptive. But we could also say, you know, we can use it if we had two chloranes attached. We could say that that was MM dichlorotoluene. All right, so it's it gets used in place of the numbers sometimes, but it'd be just as correct to call that um, would that be three five dichlorotoluene. All right, so it's it's more that we use ortho, meta, and para when we're describing what's happening rather than in the nomenclature. For the nomenclature, it makes more sense um, to, to name these things just using numbers. But when we're describing how the reactions happen, that's when we're gonna really see ortho, meta, and para show up a lot, if that makes any sense. For now, know that ortho, meta, and para exist. Um, and, but when it comes to, if I ask you a question and say, name this compound, you're fine just using the numbers. All right, so why do we have this whole different naming system? We already have a, a nomenclature system. Why are benzenes and aromatics named any differently? Well, it, it comes down to the fact that they behave very differently. The same way that conjugated dienes behave differently than the isolated dienes. <clears throat> um, conjugated, if you have an aromatic compound, it's even more stable. So if we took cyclohexene and we hydrogenated it, we go downhill in energy 120 kilojoules per mole. If we have conjugated diene and we hydrogenate both of those, it goes downhill in energy, not quite twice as much because it's already a little bit more stable because of the resonance. So it goes down, instead of going downhill in energy, 240 kilojoules per mole, it only goes downhill in energy, 232 kilojoules per mole. We would expect that if we have fully hydrogenated benzene, it should go down 360 kilojoules per mole because that's three times the hydrogenation energy of, of a single alkene. However, what we actually see is that it's actually harder, it's less downhill in energy to hydrogenate benzene than, than cyclohexadiene. Cyclohexadiene is, um, is more energy rich, is less stable than the benzene, despite the fact that benzene has an extra pi bond and pi bonds are supposed to be unstable. So it's actually stabilized. The resonance that we see is actually about 152 kilojoules per mole more stable than it should be if we just looked at the pi bonds. And I have, that's a good one. Aromatics are more stable than would otherwise be expected. All right, what does this mean? Why do we care about this? And how, does, how can we explain this? We can explain it using molecular orbitals which I get after the last chapter is not necessarily something that you feel comfortable with yet, but we can describe it the same way. I'm not gonna have you do any predictions based on these, um, but we can look at these different P orbitals that are all going to be, um, they're all gonna start as unhybridized P orbitals and look at how they can overlap with each other. And what we see is, 
there's a whole lot of ways we can have these p orbitals overlap with each other with just a few nodes. And so we wind up with, with really strong bonding orbitals and really unstable anti-bonding orbitals. However, you have to have the right number of electrons for this to happen. If we look at cyclobutadiene, so cyclobutadiene would look like it's a ring structure with two conjugated pi bonds, but that's, it's not aromatic because when you start looking at the way we would fill electrons into those, those orbitals, we wind up with them not being fully filled. And if those orbitals are not fully filled, they're not really considered bonding orbitals. They're not as effective at um, creating that stability. If we look at cyclooctatetraene, that's a ring structure. That's got conjugated pi bonds the whole way around. But again, we wind up with the orbitals such that we wind up with these partially filled non-bonding orbitals that don't make things as stable as they could be. So where, we're, where we will end today is with Huckel's rule. And Huckel's rule allows us to predict when something is going to be aromatic. For something to be aromatic, you have to have a conjugated pi system that's cyclic, and it has to have an odd number of pi bonds or pairs of pi electrons, which we can write as 4n plus 2 pi electrons or 2n plus 1 pi pairs of pi electrons. In other words, you need an odd number of electron pairs in the pi system in order for it to be aromatic. So it's got to be cyclic and it's got to have an odd number of electron pairs or in order to be aromatic. If it fills those conditions, it's aromatic and it's super stable. If it doesn't fill those conditions, then it's not aromatic. Right, so I will end there, only one minute over. Watch for the quiz to go up later today. Um, and we will continue to practice with this and predicting which of these is aromatic versus non-aromatic um, when we come back next week. And if you have any questions that you wanna to talk to me about in office hours, I have office hours at 10.30. Other than that, everybody have a good weekend. Thanks. And I'll see you on Tuesday. Thanks, Sean. Bye, guys.